you all for coming. Um, Lindsay had mentioned messes. So it's like a strange segue for our topic, but maybe it seems really, really relevant since we're talking about social justice, and I think there's a lot of messing going on right now that we really want to address, right? So our topic today is Walking the Talk, Museums Lead the Way on the Path of Social Justice. Now, fundamental to our organization, Cultural Connections, you know, we really believe that museums must ensure that we all actively and intentionally engage with our diverse communities. And this afternoon, we'll hear from several individuals who have successfully collaborated with their communities to promote dialogue around the topics of diversity, race, and inclusion. And they will be es escorting us, so to speak, on the path of social justice. So, to begin with, our moderator is Tom Izu. Tom is the executive director of the California History Center at De Anza College in Cupertino. And for 23 years, he has assisted the center to carry out its mission to preserve local, regional, and state history through publications, exhibits, courses, and workshops, and a research library and archive. Tom recently launched the Audrey Edna Butcher Civil Liberties Education Initiative, that's a lot, to promote student and community engagement issues as inspired by lessons learned from the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. He has organized events exploring the issue of mass incarceration of people of color in the United States, the 1930s repatriation and mass deportation of Mexican Americans, the current rise of Islamophobia, and he's currently working with students to create Know Your Rights workshops so they can help peers who face an increasingly uncertain environment. Last of all, Tom is a member of the advisory board of the Japanese American Museum of San Jose and also serves as a board member of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the ACLU. Now for our speakers, Renee Guzman, the Director of Exhibition Strategy and Senior Curator of Art at the Oakland Museum of California. He received his formal training in art practice at UC Berkeley and has taught in curatorial and museum studies programs at California College of the Arts and the San Francisco Art Institute. Previously, De Guzman served as Director of Visual Arts at Irving Plain Center for the Arts and among other shows, he curated the recent exhibition, All Power to the People, Black Panthers at 50 at the Oakland Museum of California. Mr. Goosen will be followed by Laura Collin, who is the founder and director of the Adoption Museum Project. This emerging social justice organization uses the power of museums to help transform adoption. Laura brings her lived experience as an adopted person and her interests in many realms such as design and poetry, dialogue, systems thinking, and movement building to the work that she does in the community. Kalani Lewis has been the Children's Discovery Museum of San Jose for the last seven years. She has held six different positions, all of which have given her the opportunity to work with different age groups and communities. Kalani has a master's degree in education specializing in counseling and student personnel from San Jose State University and has always had a passion for working with the LGBTQ community. And last of all, we have Jamie Lee Evans, who's the founder and co-director of Foster Youth Museum. She has worked in the field of youth leadership development for 20 years and listens deeply for the stories of youth both spoken and unspoken. She herself is a, foster, a former foster youth. So Tom, would you like to begin? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I think my job is just to remind you after all of those names, who's going to speak? <laughs> so you remember their name? I have a list here, so I'll remember. I, we have a short, uh, we have a lot to cover, I think. And I think I'm, I'm very, very excited and honored to be here. And I think I'm probably going to learn more than any of you here. That's my deep secret. You probably have workshops on this. Uh, Why don't you tell us really what's secret in your mind and scary? I don't think I'm a museum professional. I just do whatever I have to do to get by. So I'm going to learn a lot from all of you. So first up, we have Nay de Guzman from the Oakland Museum of California. And I'm really, really looking forward to what he said because 
the exhibit is just absolutely fantastic on the way it happens. I want to thank this program for finally making me have some respect at work when they got the, the notice that I would be speaking here. Finally, people started looking up to me. And there's a couple of OMCA people here, and they, they know I'm speaking the truth. Um, so, um, so basically, I'm going to go through really quickly uh, this project because I'm looking forward to the conversation. But I also want to set aside some time for a short video that I think represents will represent the power of the show. I want to start with this slide because um, this is an image from, I think, 1968. It, it was from one of the big rallies uh, to free Huey Newton. Of course, uh, co-founder was put in jail, and, and his trial became um, a cause celebra nationally. It, it was um, the first time the nation heard about the Black Panthers. Um, but interestingly, if you look at the background, that's the Oakland Museum of California. Those are the sort of uh, cement walls, and we were going to open in 69. So we felt a certain obligation to do this project. It, um, the Black Panther history was part of our history, and I think informs our personality as the Museum of the People. I think the reason I'm here in terms of the topic is that not only did we do this project on the 50th anniversary, because the Panthers um, you know, there's controversy around them. Um, and when other museum professionals heard what we were doing, they went kind of, ooh. Uh, it, because it's a complex history that comes out of very intense time. But we, again, we felt obliged, but also we knew that the Panthers had a lot of admiration in our community. So we wanted to reflect that. So the reason I'm here is that um, uh, in terms of walking the top, we did not shy away from talking about the context from which the Panthers grew, which is basically systematic racism. Uh, this is an image from the introductory uh, section called, um, that we call a matter of fact. Uh, we felt that in order to understand the Panthers and this country, you had to acknowledge their systematic racism and injustice. Uh, so first thing people saw, uh, for instance, the, the map that the uh, visitors are pointing to is a red mining map. Uh, and it hovers above architectural fragments from a demolished West Oakland neighborhood that was transformed during redevelopment. So we want to explain the sources of um, entrenched poverty in certain neighborhoods and how often that has a racial bias. Next. Um, we also um, found this thing in our collection, in the deepest recesses of our back of house storage, and it was the most creepy thing. And it, when we found it, it kind of explained why we heard bumps in the night. And, <laughs> you know, because we had clan materials in our collection. And it, this was collected uh, from a Bay Area chapter in the 30s. The, the clan was active in the 30s and 40s. Um, and it, it, it was material evidence that there were certain attitudes about race uh, that were um, inhabited the roots of the Bay Area. Um, so that was a very hard thing to present because not only is it um, an awful image, but for folks who, whose stories we were telling, primarily the African American community, this seeing this object is um, can cause injury. So it's a very uh, challenging thing to present. We felt obliged to show this material evidence, but we worked really hard to make sure that um, we were responsible, and I think it came off well. Next. Uh, the other thing um, that came from our collection was, um, again, sort of looking at echoes of the moment. We're at a time of war, and um, and folks that go to war are often from um, the sort of working class. But um, in Vietnam, there's a disproportionate number of African Americans injured and killed in the war, although they represented about 10% of uh, active duty soldiers. This is a great image from our Tribune collection. It's a soldier with the sign of Oakland. Um, so, so we were, we were sort of looking at different ways the systematic racism showed up at that time. Next. Um, and we also uh, made a decision that, um, you know, we're going for it. We felt in all our research and meeting the Panther community uh, that ultimately it was a positive story. Now it's complex. It was a messy time. But we weren't going to shy away from our assessment that this was an amazing movement. Uh, this is a... Um, 
this is a draft of the 10-point platform to kind of document that Yui and um, Yui Newton and Bobby Seale wrote to establish the Black Panther Party uh, in 1968. So we borrowed it from Stanford. They had the UP Newton uh, collection stumble upon it. And it's, it's a remark. it's like looking at the first draft of the Constitution, it had that kind of power. Next. Uh, we felt that it was so important to understand the Panthers within that this organized, thoughtful context that we actually blew it up on the wall. This is the second thing you saw. After the introduction of the context, you saw, writ large, their demands. And often people said, wow, a lot of those points um, uh, are so relevant today, particularly uh, police brutality, because um, we were organizing the show around the time of Ferguson and all those awful events that led to the Black Lives Matter movement. Next. We also want to talk about them as real people. You know, um, the average age of Panthers were 19. Two thirds of the membership were women. And while everyone knows these celebrated um, famous figures, a lot of their members, it was a bottoms up organization. So we wanted to highlight the kind of humanity of the organization um, and, and point to folks who weren't you known there. Um, obviously, the Black uh, Panthers were part of a, a Black Power cultural movement. Um, this is uh, a Panther newspaper uh, that had poetry, visual art, um, all sorts of di different things, as well as uh, reporting from communities around the country and the world. So we wanted to highlight that they were part of this greater cultural acknowledgement of uh, the contributions of African Americans. Next. Um, so as museum professionals, you know you can talk at people, but that only gets you so far. You need to provide opportunities for them to see themselves and connect with the subject. So I'll, I'll roll through a number of different examples where we invited people to decide how they were going to relate to the subject. Uh, this was the opening scene. It's a work of contemporary art, the chair. Um, it's a bronze replica of the famous peacock chair that Huey Newton uh, was uh, memorialized in in that famous poster. And to complete this piece, um, you had to sit in it. So that was the first gesture. You know, you had to decide how you felt about sitting within this, this story. Next. Uh, another work of contemporary art by Hank Willis Thomas. Um, what you see is a big, a big video projection in the background and um, the mic there. Um, basically, the video projection is the Confederate flag uh, cloaked in uh, red, black, and green of African liberation. So the idea is that um, the sounds, they're just soundtrack of black power speeches, civil rights speeches, and, and music. So as the, um, the video is sound activated, so it's, it, it, it sort of vibrates and, and goes into all sorts of kaleidoscopic patterns. So the idea is um, black power will overcome these sort of backwards thinking. So, so periodically, um, the soundtrack would go silent, and then the public would be invited to speak their power to the mic. And this is a young little girl. That um, there are a lot of amazing scenes like this in front of that piece. So next, um, we also had you know um, the typical kind of comment, you know, visitor comment kind of format. Um, but in this case, what we did was um, provide an opportunity for folks to name Panthers that aren't mentioned and folks to mention Panthers who are no longer with us. So it becomes a, a commemoration wall. And you can see how many uh, blue tags there are. We had to refresh that like a number of times. So thousands and thousands of people were, were mentioned. And it became a place of veneration and reflection upon people that are no longer with us. Next. This is my favorite comment book. Uh, so we asked visitors, <laughs> what, what would a Panther monument look like? And, um, I just love this. <laughs> Next. So, okay, so, there, so the reason why this was such a remark, and Brittany and her colleagues would know, is that not only was this deeply moving, if you went to the show, it was just so um, indescribable, the, the feeling of warmth and people coming together. But what made it amazing, and, and I'm not saying this in terms of any sort of like um, cold business thing, but but the people were willing to pay for this experience. And I'm not saying that in terms of consumption, but, but they voted with um, their presence in the space. And this is just a quick take on the kind of February numbers that came in. They were off the roof. Um, 
time tickets. Uh, we sold that at 10.30, there was one before we opened. Uh, the last few days, the only way you can see the show is to sign up for memberships. Now, 10% of our total membership came in for the Panthers. So, on a business side, that's amazing, but in terms of like your community saying, yeah, I believe in your project, I'm becoming a member, 10% of our current membership said that simply because of the show. Um, other geeky things, I know you're all using professional, the NPS score was uh, between 80 and 90. Um, usually for temporary exhibitions, uh, my understanding is that they have around 50. Um, uh, Jennifer's here. <coughs> uh, dwell time. Um, uh, minimum of like 15 minutes, maximum of three hours, medium and mean an hour. That's crazy. That's crazy. Seventy percent of the folks that went to the museum went to that show specifically. Um, sweep rate, 137 square feet per minute. That's super sticky. People are staying, you know. The typical is like 300, 400 maybe. So it's, it's totally geeky, but that's a good number. A lower sweep rate. That means they're staying and, and, and thinking about it. So next. Also, so the, the thing I'd like to talk about is, is how we arrived here. We, we arrived not as expert professionals, but as folks in conversation with communities. So we held a number of convenings. This is the creative convening that we held. It, it, we invited former Panthers, artists, um, uh, academics, policy people to tell us about how they felt about the story. Next. Um, uh, we also talked with young people because we wanted to connect it to today. And this is a group from this organization called Give Us the Floor. Next. Um, and we obviously work with the Panther community. Uh, this is Bobby Seal. He and other Panthers and young people, um, largely um, this group of friends of the project, we invited select numbers to come and be filmed for the video at the end of the exhibit. Um, so this is Bobby being filmed. Um, and um, if you saw the, the video at the end, it was, it, it, you felt like you met these people. Uh, next, so this is the video at the end. So we had the church pews. Again, another kind of visitor infrastructure. You have to give people places to sit and reflect. You know, they're physical beings. They need a place to reflect, etc. And we thought the church pew was quite appropriate because the, the church was very supportive of the Panthers. So with that, um, I'd love to play this video, and I look forward to talking about things in a little bit. So, video. So while we're setting up the video, this is a video. It was part of that film that I mentioned earlier. We, we commissioned three poems. Uh, one of the poems is by uh, Shanaka Haj. She's a poet, activist, uh, one of the founders that she speaks. So I think this will give you a sense, if you didn't see the show, just how powerful it was for folks. So I'll just hit plenty of them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's call a spade a spade. Let's call a pitchfork a pitchfork. Let's just say we know what a posse looked like what a mob can do. We know about chasing ghosts. We know about finding ourselves in dark rooms. We know about safety and numbers. Let's admit that the town people ain't never been afraid of the giant, that the body has always been bigger than the head, that the power has always been with, of, and for the people. So let's just tell the truth. Let's just be honest. Let's talk back. Let's march to firmary. Let's outline some points and let us speak of police who will step over our sleeping children to shoot their fathers and ask why they woke and ask why we have guns. We cannot forget how whales sound escaping from a siren or a boy. Let us call little Bobby's name. Let's call little Bobby's mama. Let's put her on the phone with Wanda Johnson or Sabrina Fulton. Let's talk about how easy it is to choke, how America's gravest mass shooting is durational, collective. Let's say wounded knee and never again. Let's say move on HQ and never again. Let's say it in the same breath as Flint, in the same water as everywhere we have been drowned. Let's say America and mean necessarily the trail we wept to get here, the choppy ocean that fought to kill us. Let's say Los Angeles and Philadelphia and Accra and mean the parts of the world who knew revolution as we did, black and impoverished and just coming back from a war like always. 
stay. Let's talk about money as if the first U.S. bailout wasn't stocked in the hull of a slave ship. Oh, but we ain't supposed to talk about that. We ain't supposed to talk about cotton. We ain't supposed to talk about that, Jim. We ain't supposed to talk about Jim Crow. We supposed to be post. We ain't supposed to ask for what's owed. We're supposed to be thankful to a tyrant. We supposed to kowtow. We're supposed to back down. We're supposed to not talk about our ache or what we've missed or how we ain't never had a language or a flag or even a proper family reunion. We are never going to know the names of the people who died for us to live in terror. Let us admit that the idea of Africa is still an offense punishable by death. We are not to dream of going home, not to speak of what has been stolen, not to feed our children, not even to let our hair take flight. We ain't supposed to do anything but die. Not nothing. We supposed to die. We supposed to not even know we supposed to die. We supposed to not speak that we know we're supposed to die. We're supposed to watch our sisters rub crack chalk on their eyes. We supposed to sit and eat stale crust and look on from the outside. What kind of party is that? Let's start our own. We supposed to sit here and wait till somebody let us? Let us stop waiting on freedom like it's the whooping cough. Stop hoping freedom is gonna court us on a Thursday date night. Quit crossing our legs and biting our time and biting our nails. It's our birthright and they will lie to us and tell us we are violent for wanting peace. Peace is our dowry. We wed to a democracy that keeps taking off its ring. We married to a decadent system that mocks squalor and honor. We saw what they do to our leaders. We see how they're trying to string us up. There are bodies on the asphalt. There are members in holding. There are lines drawn all around us and they're closing in tight. There's a courthouse. There's a free breakfast. There's Emery's pen. There are Tariqa's fingers, Sonia's poems, and Bobby's plans and kitchen. There are instruments of light and joy. There are folks waiting on orders. There are children in the hallway singing songs about our mothers. These blues people in their black leather. There are teenagers sneaking into our meetings. There are old folks who are both afraid and resentful. They didn't do this first, but some did. Some dusted off their pistols and got right to it. Right here on Grover MLK. Right here on 10th Street. Right here out front of McClellan's and Merritt. Come on, real revolution. Come, real revolution. Come, real fire and fake alibi. Come some Sunday when some brother comes to with a visceral realization that he lost sanity to a country that would have his breath on a plaque, would have his head without thinking and mounted. He's either going to want to get even or get freedom. The whole universe stands to benefit if this black man is free. The truth of the matter is white folks' freedom depends on ours, and we've outgrown a binary that excludes all other comrades. We're talking about all the people, all the people, all the people. Let's take all the power, all the power, all the power, all the people, all the people, all the people, all the power, all the power, all power to the people. excitement to start the program, I forgot to say something about why, I, why we're having this, and now I don't remember, but I'm so <laughs> glad Renee talked first, because it reminded me of one thing, is if somebody years ago had said, museums lead the way in the path of social justice, I would have been pretty cynical and say, are you sure, museums? <laughs> but if you look at what's happening right now, to the most basic institutions of this country, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, it's pretty clear that museums have a very important role to play because it's all being attacked. And so I don't think it's a view anymore of, well, I don't know, it's controversial. Maybe we better not talk about it. We're being forced to face it anyway. So of all the people in this room, I know all of you are part of this, we should have a big role to play in helping people come together. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that, so now I did. I don't remember the name. So I really appreciate Renee's presentation. Um, next up, we have Laura Callan from the Adoption Museum Project and um, Operation Day for It's really wonderful to be here, and thank you, Renee, for bringing that important story into the into this space. And I want to make a, a quick aside because I just spent three days at an, a really powerful conference in Oakland, um, the Othering and Belonging Conference. And I think for talking to a room full of folks who care deeply about social justice, um, it was just such a reminder, you know, that to take some time, if you can, to go into other spaces that are talking about social justice and bring that back into your museum work. Um, and the whole conference was live streamed and I know that they're posting it up on YouTube so I would just encourage you um, to go check that out and see how it might apply to the work that you're doing. Um, so 
I am the founder and director of the Adoption Museum Project. Um, we are an emerging organization. We're just four years old. Um, and we do museum work that helps to create justice in adoption. Um, so we have this really unique opportunity to be creating an organization from scratch that is grounded in social justice. Um, our work is, so far, um, exhibitions, public programs, convenings, and um, coming up some um, online work. Um, we do that work in collaboration with others, um, and you're welcome to go to our website and you can see some of what we have done. Um, so I'm going to start out with a little bit of context about adoption, um, because perhaps some of you in the audience don't have an understanding or an experience with adoption, and then talk a little bit about how we understand social justice, and then I'll make the connection to um, the project that we worked on, um, Operation Baby Lift, perspectives and legacies. So, um, so we are not a neutral organization. Uh, we have a very particular perspective about adoption, and we try really hard to be explicit about that and to share that perspective. Um, so adoption is culturally constructed. So we've practiced adoption in this country, legal adoption, for nearly 170 years. Um, and this social practice is shaped by our culturally specific beliefs about which individuals and which families are valuable. Um, Adoption is also this, these four adjectives, which if anybody has a word that would describe those four things, I would love for you to tell me that word. Um, but in the meantime, um, so I think of it as this very wide experience, meaning that over 60% of the population of this country has some connection to adoption. Um, and adoption exists in virtually every identity group that we know, right? It cuts across race and class and gender, sexual orientation, ability, geography, religion, and so on. Um, it is also a long experience, meaning it is a lifelong experience, right? So from the moment that adoption occurs in your life, you are always an adopted person or an adopted parent or a first parent. Um, it is deep, meaning that it has a profound impact on the individual's life. Right? their sense of identity, their sense of safety um, and belonging. Um, and it can and often does have a physical impact on people. Um, it is embedded, and by that I mean on an individual level, you can't separate adoption from the other parts of your experience. On a collective level, adoption is tightly linked to many other social issues, whether that's reproductive justice or racial justice or immigration. Um, and adoption is also a dilemma. Again, this is our perspective, this is what we're offering for you to consider, um, that adoption absolutely can, can help, right? It can serve people, it can be the right decision. Um, it also can cause enormous harm. And when that harm occurs, it can include coercion, social stigma, compromised <coughs> mental health, um, increased rates of suicide, lack of resources to support your family after adoption has happened, and a denial of personal information and even citizenship. So our work is meant to create change. And this is the world that we want to see, a world where justice and dignity exists for everybody who is affected by adoption. And our contribution to this vision um, is through museums. Right? So, museum work is not going to single-handedly change the world and create justice in adoption. But we think museums have a role to play and can make a contribution. We think of museums can actually be an intervention into this problem of a lack of, of justice. Um, and we believe, and Renee and I were chatting about this earlier, that culture change precedes policy change. And this is just a fact. I mean, we have evidence over time that this is the truth. Um, and so our work, we hope it can change the narrative of adoption, the way we think about it, the way we understand it. Um, we want to create the conditions for paying attention to this issue, critically reflecting on it, talking about it. These are all things that can happen in museum space. Um, so we think museums are quite suited for this sort of social justice work. Um, so when we decided to use our work in the service of justice, um, we knew we didn't fully understand what justice meant. 
um, I am a white person. I have a lot to learn about what justice means. Um, and the term social justice, right, is being used more and more um, in many different realms, and that's not, that's not a bad thing. Um, but it, it's actually a very specific idea, right, that has a long history um, of, with its particular values and specific practices, and it's serious work. Right? You know, social justice is about some people's survival. Um, so we decided that we would start by defining what we meant by justice. And this is, a, this is our website. It's, this is our, our page where we talk about our values and justice is listed first. And, and so we went ahead and we said, all right, we need to own where we are today with this. And we need to be able to tell people, this is what we're thinking right now, um, as a matter of integrity, as a matter of being honest with ourselves and with other people, um, and so that we could start to begin knowing for ourselves what this meant in the work that we do. And this was scary, right? This is learning in public. Um, we didn't want to appear ignorant. We didn't want to co-opt a trend. We didn't want to be disrespectful of work that other people had done. Um, next. Go ahead. Um, so we spent a lot, we're spending time learning about social justice, right, to create our own analysis, um, to internalize that and figure out how this can apply to the work that we're doing. So we're studying and learning, you know, about racial justice. Go ahead. About disability justice. Next. Reproductive justice. And I, I'm showing these three, not to say that these are the only justice movements that are out there, but these are three movements that are particularly entwined with adoption, so we're paying particular attention to them. But also just, the, the point is, you know, we're spending a lot of time just learning, right, and sitting with what that means. Um, we're also learning by doing our work, um, and so I'm gonna transition to that um, <coughs> next. So how do we translate these big complex ideas about justice into our work, into our exhibitions, and our museum work? So I'm gonna share a current theory <coughs> that, um, that we're holding, that the social justice work with museums has something to do perhaps, with being specific, right? And I think there's a way that we need to move from a lot of the generalities that we talk about down to the specific. So something about being specific, something about speaking plainly. Um, I often find myself using jargon, um, and I think that this is problematic if we really want to make change that's broad, and if we're trying to be accessible institutions. And finally, this idea of looking people in the eye, right? And, and for us, that has sort of two meanings. Um, there's the literal meaning of in museum space, um, you know, humans can interact with other humans, and this is a really um, powerful idea. But also um, the idea of being honest. Um, so go ahead. So I'm going to go quickly through uh, an exhibition that we worked on where we tried to bring some of these ideas in and put them into practice. So Presidio Trust in San Francisco invited us to co-curate an exhibition about Operation Baby Lift. Um, Presidio was an outstanding partner. I really want to honor and acknowledge um, the work that they did and the support that they gave us. Um, so Operation Baby Lift, for those who aren't familiar with it, in 1975, the very end of the American Vietnam War, um, the U.S. government, individual citizens, um, removed um, close to 2,000 Vietnamese children and brought them to the United States for the purpose of adoption. And I'll say more about that story in a second. Go ahead. Um, so I'm going to talk about three dimensions of this project, because each of these dimensions is kind of like a site of social justice work, at least the way that we think about it. Go ahead. Um, so we try to state our point of view really plainly. Um, we tried to create a process that was grounded in social justice. And go ahead. And then, of course, the product, right? Um, trying to create a product that would be embedded with social justice ideas so that the visitor could engage in that because they don't get to be part of the process. Um, go ahead. Um, so in terms of point of view, uh, we, go ahead. Um, so this is some text from the introductory panel um, of the exhibition and what I really want to just call attention to are these words that I've highlighted um, because, you know, I'm sure all of you, right, have spent painstaking hours over choosing the right language. But for us, this was really critical to convey the point of view. Again, not neutral. You know, the word removed instead of saved 
the children, right? Children instead of orphans, because they were not all orphans. Adopted, not, again, rescued or saved. Um, it was an, we called it an effort. We didn't call it a humanitarian mission. So all of these choices were meant to convey a particular point of view. So in terms of the process, um, we worked with many different communities. Um, there were internal communities. Um, that's how we thought about them. Um, you know, the staff at the project, we worked with 41 community contributors, all different connections to Operation Baby Lift. Um, and then we also worked with, and in our mind, these communities, they worked with each other, but they also engaged with the ideas. And I think that's a really interesting place to think about, right? Um, so, in, and in some ways, you know, the process work feels more important even than the product. Um, and I, I think that's, again, another really interesting thing to think about, right? Um, the, the process of building, developing, talking and interacting with your communities in the development phase, more important perhaps than the product. Um, but speaking of the product, there was one. Um, we, uh, this is a view of, of the gallery. And part of what we tried to do was center the voices of the people who had the least agency, who were the most affected, right? So the adopted people, the children who were brought over. Um, so there are several ways that we tried to do that. Um, the kiosk that you see there, the wooden kiosk, had um, audio dialogues. Um, and each one of those was a dialogue of, with uh, someone who was brought here during baby lift now in their 40s, talking with a volunteer. Um, you see the image on the window is an image of the children looking out of an airplane. So in every area of content in that exhibition, there is the voice of an adopted person. Go ahead. Um, first parents or birth parents, um, we did not have access to them because they are in Vietnam and very hard to, to locate. Um, so we created a public <coughs> program about first parents. Um, this is Deanna Ross not to be confused with Diana Ross. Um, and she gave a solo performance, uh, which is about her experience as a first parent, and then we had a panel of first parents as well. Next. Nice. This is a view of part of the timeline, and what I just want to point out here is, again, kind of really trying to think hard about what, what would social justice mean in the context of an exhibition. Um, you can see some of these headlines are speaking very directly to the way it was controversial, the way it was contested, the way that we are challenging the dominant narrative that this was a positive only event. Um, Vietnamese parents sue for the return of their children, for example, and then you, there's a little excerpt from the newspaper there. And, and that event is integrated into that timeline, right? We're not making it a sidebar and we're not trying to minimize it. It is just part of the story. Next. Um, we had a section of the gallery uh, with eight objects, um, and you'll see that there's multiple labels there. The top label is written by curators so that we could just, again, very simply explain what is this. And this is a bag that an 11-year-old um, person <laughs> brought with her to the United States. It was all she had when she came over during baby lift. Um, but the other labels are written by different people um, who were part of baby lift who have a totally different connection to it from each other. So you have a label written by an adopted person next to a label written by a Vietnam veteran next to a label written by um, an agency staff who arranged for the adoptions. And everybody's offering their own uh, reflections on this object. Um, we did not edit anything, um, and we put them side by side. Um, and this is one of the labels that was written by an adopted person who actually came before baby lift happened, but is still part of this larger community of Vietnamese adoptees. And this is, uh, we call this area the reflection area of the gallery, and we offered four different prompts, um, invited people to think about what they had just experienced. What I want to call attention to is um, we had many parts of the gallery translated into Vietnamese, um, and you can see here that someone responded in Vietnamese. Um, and I think I did it with 30 <laughs> seconds to go. <laughs>
a lot of times from my experience with our culture, when you talk about social justice, they're like these separate little objects. Like, oh, let's make sure we get this kind of culture. Well, let's make sure we talk about this kind of social justice. But Laura was saying it's a real process for us as museum people, for our own learning, too. And I just thought that was just so fantastic to hear somebody say that. And I think we have a lot to discuss. And we learned a lot from your presentation. Thank you. Next up, we have Lonnie Lewis from the Children's Discovery Museum in San Jose. One of my favorite places. I used to bring my kids like 20 some years ago. Um, and she's going to talk about Proud of My Family. All right. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, yes, like Tom said, my name is Kimani Lewis, and I am from Children's Discovery Museum in San Jose. Um, also, my former colleague, Heidi Lubin, as well, had a, who had a large part of planning this event. Proud of my family um, is, is an annual event we do at the museum now. It's a weekend event support, or celebrating LGBTQ pride, be it uh, LGBTQ parents of kids who want to come to our museum or, or LGBTQ identified children and their own families. Um, it is really a celebration for all families, of course, but um, our efforts to uh, acknowledge and, and appreciate the, the LGBTQ community. So I guess before we get into Proud of My Family itself, we'll go over the history and, and how it kind of came to be. So if we could, all right, so the history again, thank you. Um, so in 2002, there was this artist named Courtney Coolidge, and, and she developed this, this photo of photography exhibit called American Families Beyond the White Picket Fence. And, um, and later in 2012, uh, one of the former museum staff members uh, selected some works from, from the American Family exhibit uh, specifically, a, a family with, with uh, two moms, a two-mom household, uh, and, the, and her and their children, and featured these works in our art gallery at, at the museum. And being at a children's museum, this is not something that that has ever really been seen before, especially here in the South Bay, uh, up here in the city, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, you know, uh, down in San Jose, in the suburbs, you know, South Bay. Again, it's, it was it was not not something that was really done or covered. So that was in 2012 and um, later, you know, the museum did make other efforts, so if we can go ahead, uh, to not kind of not not adhere to, to assuming what makes a family. So this is a, a copy of, of our membership application and, and a lot of children's museums, they'll, they, they, they specify mother, father, uh, in terms of, of who can purchase the membership. And so the mother will fill out the name, the father will fill out the name. But Children's Discovery Museum, from day one, when it opened in 1990, made a very conscious effort to not assume it's a mother and father household. It's a two adult household, and let them be the, you know, have the option to, to select prefixes and, and, and determine who, who is in this family and which two adults uh, get to be on the membership. And, and other signage in the museum reflects that as well. So very subtle things that, that you might not even notice unless it was pointed out to you. Um, so go ahead, thank you. So we wanted to do more, uh, myself and again, Heidi Lubin and, and uh, one of our other colleagues, Natalie Rodriguez. Um, we got together and we saw these efforts but thought that we could do more at the museum. And in order to do so, the museum values itself as a cultural institution. We value everyone, but again, this is a, a community and a culture that we weren't seeing adequately represented. So following the museum's um, I guess plan, you know, whenever we want to celebrate a certain culture, we put together an advisory board or an advisory committee. So the three of us got together and, and decided we want to do this. Let's put together our advisory board and see what more we can do. So with that, we um, sent out a pitch to uh, local organizations in the, in the South Bay again specifically uh, to try and um, get people together to, to help us out with this. You know, we, we knew that, that even though we, we, the three of us specifically, you know, we're all part of this community, but by no means are we experts. By no means is the museum an expert. We wanted to trust others who were. So we sent out this blast to them, and we actually were very, very pleased with the response we got. Um, we ended up coming together with a group of individuals from specifically San Jose organizations, the LGBTQ Youth Space, the Billy DeFrank Center, uh, the Santa Clara County Office of LGBTQ Affairs, which is awesome. It's the first office of LGBTQ Affairs in the country. Um, and the Gender, Ident Gender Identity Awareness Network, the Health Trust. We also had some individual parents of LGBTQ identified youth and kids come in. Uh, so a good group of, of both professionals and individuals, parents, etc. Uh, so to help us out, you know, we realized that, that right off the bat, we wanted to do Part of My Family Weekend. We wanted to beef it up. 
but we didn't have any marketing materials or any photographs that really illustrated the types of families that we wanted to target and, and, and bring in. So uh, we, we had photo sessions and, and, and developed marketing materials. We put out calls for photos, specifically asked for LGBTQ identified families to come in with their kids and, and be, be a part of our museum, be part of our, our family. So we did a bilingual call and we actually got a really great response. Uh, we, we utilized our, our, our advisory board participants and, and, and friends um, and they helped us and actually it was through them that we got the responses that we got. So we had three families come in. This is Shay and Yolanda and one of their ch children. Um, we had Adrian and Aaron and their son Hunter and we had Cassie and her partner and their son um, all come in and, and take really great photos with us. And, and you'll see the top corner there, the LGBT youth space, both um, two of the families are, are actually working at the, at the youth space and they gave us great, um, great uh, nods on social media to that. Um, so we also utilize social media to really blast out our efforts. We're on Facebook. At the time we were really new to Instagram and we were also on Twitter. So we utilized our social media campaigns to put the presence out. These, you know, you can go ahead and just really scroll through these. Facebook, uh, thousands of people reached on Facebook, hundreds of people reached on Twitter, uh, even on Instagram, we, we had several hits as well. Um, so really getting the word out to be present and be very upfront about what it was we wanted to do. We had other promotional outlet, outlets as well. The signature line for all the emails that were sent from the museum, we listed on our calendar pages, we put out formal press releases. Uh, other, the San Jose Mercury News, our big newspaper down, down in San Jose, wrote an article about us, uh, about our event, and, and really spread the word that way. So it was really great. Um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. And that was our formal press release. Thank you. Um, so programming. The event finally came, and it was very exciting. And we decided to just completely highlight in all the spaces. And, and Heidi was, was a big part of this in developing special programming that we did uh, both days. It was a whole weekend event. It was Saturday and Sunday the last weekend in August we aligned with Silicon Valley Pride, uh, our own Pride celebration in San Jose. Uh, so we had presence on site at the museum for our celebration. We had Adrian again there from, from the LGBTQ space as, as well as materials from our other community partners. And we went to Pride ourselves as well and had our own table there to be present and, 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 and in both places at both times. So some of our activities, we had family-based activities asking people what, what makes a family we did a rainbow reflections activity where we identified what each color on the pride flag stood for and we asked kids and families to respond to prompts answering those questions. Uh, we had rainbow flags all over the place. Uh, sorry, can we actually go back? Yeah, sorry. Uh, Backdrops so families could take their own family portraits. We really, really were just trying to drive home that point of family. Everyone is family to us as, at the museum as well as to each other. Um, okay, no, sorry, thank you. <laughs> so, this all goes back to us wanting to, you know, address diversity and social justice from the lens of the of a children's museum. And this is a welcoming statement that was actually developed a couple, a few years ago now, two, two or three years ago, um, that has been out. It's on the museum website, and this really, very clearly, I think, depicts the museum's stance on social justice and diversity and, and what it means to be a community acre. Uh, and these six bullet points here do really, really enforce the fact that. That you know the third one here, culture is more than ethnicity. It is a set of values, beliefs, traditions, and experiences. Everyone feels welcome, included, and well represented at the museum. Um, just really, really trying to drive home these points that that everyone has a place within our museum, and, and that is that is our, our our hope and our goal of proud of my family. Um, again, to to address families and, and uh, through through the lens of of, of children's museums. Um, so. Other work and furthering the cause, you know, Proud of My Family is great, but it's one weekend a year. Um, so one of the other things we were, we've, we've gotten feedback from and, and we're hearing was that, um, you know, our bathrooms all follow the gender binary and that doesn't work for everyone. Uh, so we have with this picture here on the left, you can't really see it, but, but the sign on the door says first aid. That was our first aid room and um, go ahead and click the, the thing. So uh, we we tore it up, essentially. We tore out the first aid room and put in a single cell restroom. This is temporary signage, but this is now a single cell restroom that is that is our identified and, and our specific all-gender restroom. So, so now everyone feels like they have a place within our museum that they can go and be safe. Um, to the right, where you can't see but behind the, beyond the blue wall, um, is another second room. We call it the quiet room, and it can be used for baby care. Um, you know, can be used to address needs of, of, of 
families with maybe kids on the autism spectrum or somewhere who need a quiet space to go and, and need a safe space again. Our, our goal really is to just create safe space, safe spaces for everyone, be them LGBTQ plus or, or, or not. Uh, so our quiet room was installed, our, our single stall, all gender restroom was installed, um, and this is a definite permanent change uh, that has happened. I, yeah, so permanent changes. Um, so <coughs> challenges we faced. Um, in terms of especially part of my family weekend, the, the museum is an institution and as a whole again, being in the South Bay, being in a suburb, um, are we, you know, the directors and, and some of the, there was some concern about how the public would receive us putting on an LGBTQ specific event. So um, we developed language and talking points for staff who could carry these, these points in their pockets and they went out to all the staff at the museum to emphasize why we're doing this, why it's important. And, and what it is that we're doing. So the first point was that Proud of My Family Weekend is a way for us to honor commitment to cultural competence and inclusion, again, for everyone. And this all welcomes, uh, references back to our welcoming statement. We are committed to promoting the cultural, culture and diversity of our region. So again, beyond the Bay Area. Um, we strive to make sure that everyone feels welcome, included, and well represented at our museum. And finally, Proud of My Family Weekend is created in partnership with the museum's LGBTQ advisory board. Um, again, who's part of that board. So not only did we, we want the staff to know that, that it is important that we are identifying and addressing the LGBTQ community, but also just culture and competence and diversity and everyone as a whole. And that even if there was issue with, with it being LGBTQ identified and centered, uh, that we did consult professionals and we did consult parents and individuals within that community as well who circled back and who did support us and who were part of uh, the San Jose area and, and, and the South Bay. Um, and so just furthering furthering our cause, you know, we hope just to continue to see part of my family grow and we hope to see other children's museums especially um, really kind of take take this on and, and, and acknowledge and, and support and be inclusive of all families no matter what. And that is our goal at, this, at Children's Discovery Museum of San Jose and again, we hope to see that continue to grow and, and spread throughout other children's museums. Thank you, uh, um, I really appreciate how she talked about language. And all of you in museum business, I'm not an editor at all. I write things, there are typos all over the place, it's, it's terrible. But those, we really need people like that. But she's talking about a different level when you talk about social justice. And it's not just what people say, political correctness. We're talking about how do you actually explain something, use the right words, and you have to unite your whole staff if you have one on this. And you have to have the involvement of the community. So I'd really like you to think about that, and we have a lot of saying this, to discuss more about how do you work with the community, how do you work with your own staff. So I really appreciate that. Now our, our final speaker is Jamie Lee Evans from the Foster Youth Museum. Thank you so much. It's so great to be part of uh, such a thoughtful and um, powerful group of presenters and people doing good thinking and good organizing. I want to acknowledge the organizers for including Foster Youth Museum in this. What a great opportunity for us. And I also want to um, thank uh, Jeannie Yoon, who is the co-director of Foster Youth Museum, and who's here with us today. And, and Jeannie, I would argue, does most of the real work of the museum, but hates public speaking. So, <clears throat> here I am. Sorry for my nasal voice. Um, I have a bit of a cold. Um, I also want to thank Marjorie Schwartzer, who is not a foster youth, but who is a really amazing champion for foster youth and in the promotion of Foster Youth Museum and has done a tremendous amount to help us move from um, a little story to a big story and to a small platform to a large platform. So thank you, Marjorie. Um, okay, let's see. No, this really doesn't work. Okay. Foster Youth Museum um, is a project of California Youth Connection. We were not always there, but we are now. And it is a, a really powerful institution um, of current and former foster youth that do advocacy work to change the foster care system. Today is Foster Care, foster care Awareness Day. Um, so I'm wearing this fabulous blue because blue is the signature color. There are two former foster youth who created um, this day, which is actually now a national um, Foster Youth Awareness Day. 
Um, and, uh, and so uh, if you want to get online and, and put a piece of blue on and tag yourself and say, I care about foster youth, that would be something to do today. Um, so that's exciting to be talking about foster youth today. There's over um, 184 children, one out of every 184 children is in foster care. Um, there's over 65,000 in California alone. Um, you know, why do kids go into foster care, uh, neglect, um, physical and sexual abuse, drug and alcohol addiction, violence against women, um, <coughs> oppression, classism. Um, approximately half of foster youth who emancipate from care um, are homeless within the first two years. And in California, um, we weren't the first state to do this, but in the last five years there has been a change in the law and now youth can opt to stay in foster care until age 21. What we know about most, quote, intact families in the United States is they be, stay dependent upon their parents, children stay depend, dependent upon their parents till age 27. And I, I doubt with the recent economic stuff with housing and stuff that's actually accurate anymore. My guess is it's later um, than that. But what happens, uh, what had happened in California before is you exit foster care at 18 and most youth immediately become uh, homeless. Now you can exit, exit foster care at 21 and between 18 to 21 there's a tremendous amount of good support available to most youth um, and that includes money that helps them to hopefully stay from being homeless and also support so that they can build permanent connections in their lives that will help, help them ongoing. Um, what we know is that people still become homeless after that as well. Um, foster youth are three to six times more likely to experience mental health challenges than kids in the general population and have higher rates of PTSD than war veterans. That is powerful information. Next. So we were founded in 2005 by a project called the Youth Training Project, which is named by young people, youth offering unique, tangible help. They are young people who write curriculum and deliver it to child welfare professionals in the state of California. Um, we were conceived by young people who were creating curriculum on how to tra train child welfare supervisors, how to train their workers on how to better serve teenagers. And what happened was, in this uh, meeting on curriculum development, a bunch of folks kept saying, well, I have this item I can bring in that will help demonstrate this idea we're trying to get across. And after I heard two or three um, young people um, talk about these artifacts, I thought, we should gather these together. Because not everybody has the aptitude or the personality or the desire to sit in a room and really take in information on training. Not everyone's going to read a book. Very More people probably go to movies. But you know, there's lots of different ways to teach. And, and museums were, were not a way I had, had gotten to. I didn't have a lot of personal experience with museums. But I just had this feeling that this was going to be a way to reach more people about foster youth than we'd ever done before. So that's how we did it. Um, the, I would say that the people who kept coming forward with um, artifacts were young people who were actually in their 20s and 30s and had been in foster care. They were lawyers, they were supervisors, they were business professionals, and they still held artifacts from their childhood from traumatic things that happened to them in foster care. Um, so it, that's a pretty powerful thing to say. Like a lot of folks are like, oh, there's the people who are just naturally resilient and the other ones who fall behind <clears throat> and the, they never in the two shall meet. Um, but in fact, the very, quote, successful foster youth were still holding things that they had in care. Um, we put out a word of mouth um, collection and in about three, a uh, word of mouth request for items. In about three months, we got a ton of things donated. Um, so we are, <clears throat> when Marjorie got us into the Western Museum Association Conference last year, I learned that we are a small, culturally specific <laughs> We are a new training and learning modality about the experience of foster care from a youth's perspective. Um, we make visible the stories that were really meant to be silent and hidden. We are a sacred and serious and intense holding space and indeed a vessel for healing. People often ask us, why do people give you things that are so profoundly important to their childhood or to their lives, including things like their law school um, uh, graduation forms and certificates, their first teddy bear. Um, things like that, and people give it to us because they want the story to continue, and also they see an opportunity for themselves to grow by letting go of the object and having it go on to the bigger world. <clears throat> I want to say one more thing about language, though. <clears throat> we, um, we are called the Foster Youth Museum, and people mistake us sometimes, and even on, on forms and in press releases, they call us the Foster Care Museum. 
And we are not the foster care museum, we are the foster youth museum. We tell the story of foster care from a youth's perspective. So thank you everyone who talked about language earlier. <clears throat> it really is powerful. Um, so some of the first items that were given to us, a seclusion room sign, a hospital gown, a high school and a college diploma. Totally interesting. Um, <clears throat> The hospital gown was worn, um, and it, well, I'll show you in a moment, the signature photograph we used to, to talk about the museum. Um, by a, the hospital gown was worn by someone who was in, basically incarcerated. Um, when you go into foster care, if you behave in ways that uh, foster parents can't manage or group homes can't manage, they, they lock you up, essentially. Um, and when you get locked up, you either go into juvenile hall or into an institution. And, um, and you get all of your ability to express yourself through clothing, which is pretty important for teenagers, um, uh, taken away from you. And so we have this wonderful gown that was actually worn in, in an institution um, that was donated to someone, again, carried through their life after they had far gotten out of it. Um, <clears throat> the seclusion room sign, I'll just briefly say, was taken off the wall from a youth who went from a 0 0.5 GPA to summa cum laude in college grad. Um, the difference in between, the difference when you get support or don't get support, right? Those are the, the great differences. Anyhow, this person was locked in group homes quite frequently in seclusion rooms for behaving badly. And when she left that group home, she walked out of the, out of the building and ripped the sign off the wall. And in her 30s, still had this sign and donated it to us. Okay, next. Um, so we currently have three exhibitions. <clears throat> we don't have a building. Uh, we are a traveling uh, museum that has a signature exhibition called Lost Childhoods, a second exhibition called Homeless, um, like I mentioned, the stats around youth going into homelessness, and um, a third exhibition, which is all photographs, called Tribute Foster Youth Tattoo Stories, and those are photographs all taken by Ray Busolari, who was a USF graduate, and came to us as an intern, and he said, um, I can take some pictures, you know, and I was like, sure, sure, everyone bust out the camera and can take a photograph. But Ray, you actually can take some pictures, <laughs> so you'll see that later. And he, he's a true champion and ally of the project. Next. Um, so this is the, um, the, the gown that I mentioned. Um, it's a signature uh, piece for lost childhoods. Ray collaborated with Captain, who is the subject of the photograph, um, uh, on where to take the photograph, how to take the photograph. We gave Captain an artistic um, listing as part of the uh, photo credit. Um, and you can see it says, stay off the ledge, and um, that's the real gown. Next. Um, our homeless exhibit has about 75 items. Uh, we wanted to keep it real. Um, I mentioned the stats on homelessness. We decided we wanted a sign, um, an, you know, when folks stand in the corner and ask for money. And we, um, we drove around. Um, I am a former foster youth who drives a BMW. Yeah, that's for real. And um, so it was kind of shitty for me to drive around asking homeless people if I could buy their signs, but I did it anyways. And um, I did it with a former uh, homeless youth, and I paid him. And I, um, we basically, I'd, I'd stop a block away, and he'd get out, and he'd talk to them. The first, yeah, the first person that we talked to happened to be a former foster youth who was 20 in Oakland, <laughs> who was, um, uh, in fact, in care in Alameda County, and we bought his sign for 20 bucks, and that was his sign. Next. Um, the tribute exhibit tells the story of foster care from a youth's perspective in, in giving tribute to their tattoos. We photographed, I don't know why that's doing that, but we photographed um, 22 uh, young people who have tattoos specifically that they got um, as uh, telling the story of foster care. So not just foster youth who have tats, it's actually youth who have tats about their experience of foster care. And what we found was that when we were interviewing and photographing youth for other exhibitions, they would often talk about their tattoos. And so Ray saw a trend and asked, can, asked, can we make this exhibition? And we said yes. yes. So um, we've been through California, um, and we uh, did some uh, really cool exhibition in Grace Cathedral. I don't know if anyone saw us there. And we have something new coming up next. Um, <clears throat> we've been all over the, the state and the country. We started um, with a state grant, a federal grant, actually. So we had the opportunity to go to Hawaii, um, we've been paid to go to Fayetteville, Arkansas. People said, why go to Fayetteville, Arkansas? I said, why not? It's one of the most racist, messed up states in the country. Absolutely, we should go to Fayetteville. Actually, Fayetteville is like Berkeley. So if you want to go somewhere cool in Arkansas, go to Fayetteville. But <laughs> the rest of the country, the rest of the state is pretty messed up. Anyways, next. So um, I want to just tell a little bit in four minutes about this exhibit. So homeless, this is our homeless exhibition. We asked you what represents homelessness to you. And guess what? 
Which items were donated first? You tell me. We said, we want homeless youth to donate things. By the way, we bought them from them. And I'll tell a story about that in a moment. Yeah. A backpack. A backpack. No. You bet. Yeah. No. Good one. Yeah. Pet leashes. Pet leashes. Oh, interesting. No, let's go to see. The first thing were weapons. Weapons and protection. So the left one was, these are all actual things that youth gave, gave to us. We purchased from them. Um, and um, the one was a uh, lock in a sock, because you can use that as a weapon. And the other one was a knife. And apparently knife sheaths are really, really expensive. So he made his out of duct tape um, and, and pass it on. Next. Um, we asked for uh, clothing. Uh, this was actual clothing that homeless youth used. And when, uh, like I said, we always did remuneration. We offered money for people to give us things. Um, and in this, I said, can I, you're giving us a shirt and a jacket, can I buy you a jacket? No. Can I buy you a pair of cool tennis shoes? No. Can I buy you a pair of pants? No. What? Okay, I have to buy you something. What can I buy you? And he said, I'd like a sword. And I said, I cannot buy you a sword. Uh, that's just going to be weird to to expense to the funder. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then I, you know, we went to a shoe store, I tried to talk into this hundred pair, hundred dollar pair of shoes, wouldn't go. Um, and then he said, okay, how about a chainsaw? And I was like, oh man, a chainsaw? That's really intense. Why do you want a chainsaw? Well, this youth is from a rural community and he said, if you buy me a chainsaw, I can cut down trees and sell wood and I can have money. So I was like, all right, hmm, okay. So we both went into Home Depot, um, and I bought a gift card. And then I gave it to him, and then he bought a chainsaw. Okay, we got the chainsaw. Next. Um, we included in the homeless exhibition about tra transformation and hope. Um, this is an actual pen. Unfortunately, it is from Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was governor. Um, but he signed legislation um, around foster care that was important and gave this pen to a young person. And we. Um, we gave some money to a young person to have this pen at the show. All right. um, the last thing is that we um, we want people to engage in social change with us. Um, we asked young people what was the most important gift that a homeless youth can get, and they said fresh socks. I see you've got some freshies out there, um, and we were told they're called freshies. So we went out. We actually asked a religious institution to give us money to buy socks that we can have in the in the museum. That we wrap up and we have a little message on the back of them. And it says, you know, these are these are really helpful to homeless youth. Your job now is to take these socks and give them to homeless youth on the streets. Um, and so every time we show homeless, we uh, we include that. Next, um, so uh, authentic engagement. I got one minute. So in terms of social justice, if you want to really engage true people into your museums, you need to have knowledge in the, of the diverse and daily realities of what they're going through. Um, you have to respect and appreciate them. This in this case, youth. Um, you need to have resources, accommodations, and time. Um, you personally need a strong constitution so that you can deal with the intensity that goes on with the folks that donate things to the museum, the folks that come and see the museum. Um, and you need to have high expectations, patience, and support, big love and rapport for the young people that engage with you. Last thing, I think. Okay, so these are some photographs by Ray Busuari from the tattoo exhibit, so we'll just shoot through them next. This is um, Valentino, he, he is a former um, uh, commercially sexually exploited child, and he got a tattoo on it with a geisha on it, um, and and has memoirs of the geisha, which was an important book for him in his survival, and so that's where this photograph was taken. Um, this is Marcy. She's deeply religious. She got that tattoo on her, sh on her chest and says, "I am not, I am not afraid. I was born to do this, and that was a gang thing." Um, and she's her whole family is gang involved. She's not anymore. Um, and just love this photograph. Next. Um, and you saw Captain, and I think that's, uh, ah, there's the trash bags that Laura mentioned. Um, so this is from another, our, our signature exhibition. And I think that's where we're done. Oh, uh, last one. Ah, okay, so this is Rebecca. I've got 18 seconds. She was in foster care. A religious group um, tried to support foster youth by having, uh, giving them Bibles. Um, a religious group gave Bibles to children who had incarcerated parents. They had her name. Um, <clears throat> engraved on it and inside they said don't worry Rebecca your father really loves you but Rebecca's father was in jail for molesting her so that was kind of fucked up um, anyhow it's important to tell these stories no one ever thought that story was going to get told and uh, we're really proud and privileged to be able to do that thank you Kate Nation.
what I was struck so much by this is understanding how if you're trying to reach a community or tell that community story, you have to let them tell you the story, right? Which seems obvious. And I'm sure you students in museum schools, I'm sure they're telling you to do that now. I sure hope they are. They must be. But back in the day, I don't think people thought that. I'm the expert. I'm going to tell the story. But you see how important that is, how powerful that is. But then also what you brought up is, well, the person themselves, the museum person, has to have a certain ability to be able to do that, and also internally has to have a certain strength to be able to see this and understand this. And I never really thought about that. I didn't borrow any social words. No, it's not exactly. We're helping them amplify their story. So um, I really appreciated that. And I think what we're going to do now is we're going to have our question and answer period, right? And I have joining us uh, Natalie Rodriguez from the Children's Discovery Museum. Heidi. I'm sorry. Heidi Lubin is from the Children's Discovery Museum of San Jose. She's joining uh, along for our discussion and answer. I'm sorry. Um, so, is anybody just dying to ask a question? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you all. It's really great uh, to learn about all these projects. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Renee, because when I saw the um, All Power to the People exhibition, I was also really struck by the um, Plan robe and I found it really powerful. I was curious about the decision to display it laying flat as opposed to like you know, how it would be worn and what factors went into making oh, that. Okay, decision. I'll repeat the question. Um, the question is, is how how did you decide to uh, display the plan robe flat? And why why that? Oh yeah, that's um, you asked that because it was as I mentioned, it's a very delicate object. Um, it's not, so we displayed it flat. So in, in a way, you could think about it as um, sort of being uh, having its sort of power removed. Yeah, that's but right. but it, it, it's also it was flat, but also inset in the wall. So the metaphor. So on the one hand, we didn't want to put it in people's face because it's, it's an awful object. Um, so the strategy was to acknowledge it, but, but also set it back. So that was part of the study, laying flat, but also setting it in a wall. Mm -hmm. And we found that that was actually even more powerful because it started um, representing how these attitudes were embedded in the space. So it, it actually became part of the architecture. Um, and then I should also say that um, to echo a lot of what was discussed, we made this decision not purely as a curatorial and exhibit design decision, but, but we really talked to staff members. And um, so we got two messages. Um, uh, do it delicately, but please do it, because it was material evidence, but make sure to do it responsibly. And this was um, you know, African-American members of staff, uh, Panther community folks. They thought it was important, but, but in terms of learning about other people's experiences, for me, that was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. But in my experience, I had never had family members have a prosper on the lawn. So it was transformative that one. Back there? Hi, my name is Lauren. Um, I have a question for Jamie or did Jamie leave? Jamie. Okay. Um, I was just wondering about the process of calling objects that you might have received that are obviously very sentimental and have a lot of meaning as small or big or in between and uh, just how you might have needed to create new methods for displaying or handling, do you give it back? I'm kind of just interested in that process. Yeah, so, so, so the question, if I may repeat it, is, is how you, you uh, dealt with all of these uh, kind of self-curated projects that I mean, artifacts that came in and how you figured out how to display them and deal with them. So we do it in different ways, and we're not we're growing in our museum expertise. I was going to say we're not museum experts, but I think I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> but um, we are certainly learning and growing. Um, we we started by putting things on on uh, uh, shoe boxes on a table, and then we went to shoe boxes on a tablecloth table, and then we went to a tablecloth table with risers. And then Marjorie Swartzer came into our lives as a consultant, and we got serious. And now we have um, vitrines and vitrine folders and stands and 20 by 30, 20, 30 by 40 photographs, and, and really profoundly shazam. You know, I should mention our museum is 
I'm going to be exhibiting at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History for six months starting July 7th. So you get to see some of Lost Childhoods there and some collaborative work we're doing with their community. Um, so we do ask that at this point in the beginning, we just collected a bunch of stuff and carried it around in suitcases. It was terrible. When Marjorie came in, she was appalled. <laughs> we have some prison, some letters from a father, father who was in prison that um, he sent to his daughter, and he died shortly after she got out of foster care. And she gave, donated these letters to us, and we just had them on a table where people would pick them up and read them. Mm -hmm. and, and people were freaking out, like they're de deteriorating and degrading. Um, and so we, we gave up a certain kind of homespun, connected feeling with the museum when we started getting vitrines and stands and so forth. Um, and we get different feedback about what that means to our, our viewers. Um, but we're doing that to protect, and we do try to show the stories with as much honor and dignity, because that's certainly one of the things that foster youth don't get in, in general, is their stories told with honor and dignity. And so it's really important for us to do that. I do want to um, mention that we, we not only have artifacts, but we get stories that are told to us, things that, that aren't there. So there's two things in our museum that we recreated. One of them is um, a toilet paper sanitary cat, where a youth who was told, their foster parents told her, I'm not paid to get you sanitary cat. So at age 10, when she started her period, she started to make sanitary pads out of toilet paper and staples. And nobody wants staples near your genitals, but that's what this 10-year-old thought would be right. So we, we, we tell that story by recreating it. There's also a story we tell about the Klan, actually. So we had an LGBTQ youth teaching up in Reading, and she was talking about LGBTQ rights for young people. And somebody stood up and said, well, you know, um, it's part of cultural reality that some families are in the clan, and um, so if, in, in, if, if foster care is supposed to be representing family values, that's a value that's very real, just like homophobia is very real, and so those families shouldn't be denied the right to be foster families because some kids are racist and that's part of their family value. Um, <clears throat> so we told that story by making a little clan figurine out of like a dancing, like a 10 inch thing. Um, and, and even though it's only 10 inches tall, when people come up to it, they're just like, wow. And so again, that question about responsibly showing really historically and institutionally powerful, hateful things is really intense. And so and there's a lot of times when we don't show that piece. There are also a lot of times we don't put the weapons out because it's triggering people or we're worried about safety and what have you. Um, so there's there's lots of different ways, and if you'd like to come volunteer with us and help us get even better, we would. Um, we, we're much better now, um, but we still can't afford like climate control, safe storage space. Um, we can't afford. I mean, everything's wrapped in like moving blankets and scotch tape. I mean, it's just it's tough. You have to have a lot of money to agree, to do a museum. Yes, right. white. Is partly in, in, in response to something that Lonnie mentioned as well as Laura in terms of values and language. But I'm thinking about what happens after an exhibition is put together and all the careful collaboration and work that goes into it, um, particularly how you communicate with staff and volunteers about supporting the messages and the values your work is trying to put forward into the world. And how do you keep that dialogue going? Um, beyond just what you created. Um, and so I know some of you are dealing with traveling exhibitions or may not have permanent spaces or permanent staff that, that are in, engaging in those conversations, but for those of you who do or who have feedback from places that your work has traveled, um, comment. Yeah, so for the camera, the question really briefly is, is saying, well, what do you do after the exhibit? How do you keep the discussion going? With staff, volunteers, and the community. So, so any of you like to comment? Um, I, I think that that's an area that, you know, museums, including ours, really needs to, to work on. And, and I was <coughs> recently thinking um, about this idea, and I think it sort of came out of um, some social work practices, you know, we talk about wraparound services, right? And it's, it's just kind of inspired this thought, right, that and there's there's the product, there's what we tend to focus on so much, right, creating a physical exhibition that's up for, you know, X amount of time. Um, 
um, but what if we thought about this as more of a wraparound concept where we have all that development work and that process that you go through in the you know, before the show opens, and then you have your experience of exhibition, and then afterwards, right? And so I'm wondering well, what would that look like, right? And and but I, I so I really appreciate your question because I think that's maybe a way that we can you know next level, right, of doing this work um, because I think there is a responsibility, right? Um, if you're gonna really going to you know, ask people um, to do this sort of thinking and do this kind of reflecting and, and open themselves up to really difficult stories and, um, and get involved in really difficult work. And I, I think the institution has a responsibility. Um, so we're just, you know, we haven't gone there. We haven't accomplished that. But, but I, I think it's um, a really important and you know, our hope, I guess, is that whatever project we create, um, the folks who helped us to create it, all the people who came and experienced it, that we can right, maintain a relationship with them. But somehow, a uh, more substantive and meaningful relationship than just stay on the newsletter so you can come back to our next project, right? Like, how can you get people involved in the actual ideas, you know, the actual social justice piece of that. Um, so, yeah, so thank you for that. Uh, Kalani, I think that you have anything to add? Yeah, I think, you know, at it, 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 our museum, I showed the, the welcoming statement, and um, fortunately for us, um, it's something that's, that's really embedded into our everyday values, and, and even though we put on Proud of My Family once a year, um, we do talk about it every day, and, and we experience it every day and, and as, as, as an organization that, that views itself as a cultural institution, it is something at the forefront of everyone's mind always. And, and you know, for myself personally, my primary role at the museum, I'm a staff supervisor, so I'm not a programmer, I'm not a developer. Uh, putting on part of my family was something way out of the, my job description. Um, and so for me to be able to be in that position, to have that conversation with staff and volunteers on a daily basis is, is extremely helpful. Uh, but then even back to Project Family specifically, you know, we, we put the festival on within our walls and, and you know, what you were talking about, the wraparound. Um, we were, were making a very conscious effort to say, come to us, but then also we went to Pride. We were at that celebration too, and, and we were trying to show that, that community that we are also willing to go to you and really open this, you know, make it a two-way street. And then also our advisory committee continues to meet. So it just didn't end. It wasn't for just this one event. That was part of part of part of one of the events that support the mission and uh, the committee's work, right? And then also um, gearing up for the weekend event, uh, we kind of investigated and examined all of our materials, even on the on the floor, like our books, our literature, our signage. Um, we opened up the discussion about. Um, we talked to our staff about offering a family restroom, you know, and, or making that noticeable, even though the bathroom hadn't been, the restroom hadn't been developed, but making those resources available and really calling attention to the resource that we already have in the museum, and then also, um, you know, what, you know, with that big push to add more materials and representative materials, reflective materials of the people who came through our, our, our doors. And Kimani didn't mention, but, that weekend, we have over over three thousand visitors. Three thousand visitors, and just having that kind of event. Not everyone is even aware that we're having an event, but walking through the door, seeing uh, the pride flag, um, was you know comforting and like it's you know a kind of unexpected for actually a lot of people. We were just walking through our doors that day, um, so. You know, it continues, and the advisory board continues to meet, and they're including the museum in a various um, work. I think the LGBTQ Office of Affairs wanted to do some kind of a photo shoot, and they're they're working on their own kind of materials, um, working with children um, that they're bringing the the museum into as well. So it's it kind of just opened up uh, a lot of room for collaboration and ways to kind of continue the work more deeply. Yeah. I just want to add one other quick thing because we, we just came back um, 
last week from doing a couple of focus groups in Seattle. And the purpose of focus groups is to start thinking about what would membership look like in an organization like ours, which is particularly fraught when you think about membership and adoption. Um, <laughs> but uh, but what, something that, you know, I, I would really interested in people's thoughts on this is what would it what would it mean if you belonged and felt like you were part of a cause and an issue as opposed to being part of an institution, right? So we're sort of trying to really think about, um, and, and the reason I'm offering this with respect to your question is because I think if, if people learn about you and they really align with and support and engage with your mission and your values, right, at that level, again, it's not that the work itself is unimportant. You know, they can't engage with it unless there's actual work, right? But what would it mean if people didn't actually belong to the Adoption Museum Project, but they said, yeah, you know, I belong to transforming adoption. I belong to wanting justice for people connected to adoption. So. <laughs> you had a question. Oh, so I just wanted to thank all of you because I just, all of you are doing such extraordinary work that's giving voice to voiceless people. And I mean, I live right near the Open Museum, Renee, so I saw the people who couldn't get parking. Um, it was just <laughs> such a um, important thing for people from all these communities. I met a woman in front of the Open Museum who had driven from North Carolina. I mean, you hear these stories all the time, you know, with her grandchildren to see that exhibit was so important. So giving voice to the voiceless is um, tremendously what you're doing. And I also think you're saving lives with this kind of work, which is what moves me so much with the Foster Youth Museum, um, which is so extraordinary. And the, the stories, you know, she's just unpeeling the onion a little bit in terms of the stories that are embedded in so many of those objects. Um, and with that, my question is actually for Laura. Um, and I, I thought your presentation was knocked it off the park. I thought it was so interesting and compelling. And I'm just curious about how you came as your first kind of breakout exhibition to tell the operation of David the story. Like, what, why did you guys decide to make that choice? Okay, so for the camera, the question is for Laura, how did you come up with the Operation Baby? I mean, why was that the first exhibit we did? Well, like any good startup organization, it was completely opportunistic. And it was entirely about networking. So we had actually done a, a first exhibition um, prior to that, and very, very small. Um, extraordinary, but on a totally different scale. And somebody who knew what we were doing and knew that the Presidio was planning to do an exhibition on this topic said, hey, maybe you should talk to this organization. And so we connected and they originally said, well, maybe you'd like to do some programming because we're going to do an exhibition and maybe you would like to design a program or two that would go along with it. Um, and so in presenting that, those concepts or kind of pitching ourselves for that. Um, like, I didn't know how to um, explain the kind of programming we would produce without explaining our thoughts on the exhibition, you know. And, and so it really wasn't intentionally trying to pitch ourselves to be co-curators. So we've never done that work, you know. And, um, but they said, hey, actually, would you like to co-curate this exhibition with us? Um, and I actually, my first thought was to say no, because I, I have, you know, I take this work really seriously, both what it means to be a museum professional doing this work, but also what it would mean to tell the story. And I felt like, wow, you know, I just don't know if we have, you know, the chops and the experience to do this well. And I'm not interested in, in doing it. We can't do it justice. Um, so I, I was persuaded otherwise. Um, but 
but what's interesting is that the Presidio um, had never told the story, and something about maybe the story um, that will make this make sense is that um, Presidio was the first reception center for the children. Mm -hmm. So this is part of their history, which I didn't even know that. Um, and so when they said, hey, you know, we're going to do this topic, and would you like to co-curate? And my first thought was, oh, the Presidio is a form of government, um, you know, uh, installation. And this for sure, they're going to want to tell this very, um, you know, the dominant narrative of maybe that they're going to want to talk about the rescue, they're going to want to make this be a humanitarian saving effort. And, you know, I actually remember sitting down in this very first meeting and going, like, oh my God, you know, like, if we could do this project, that would be amazing. This would be like our start, you know? And yet knowing that if I didn't clarify with them up front, what is your intention here? Kind of story you can tell that we couldn't, we couldn't do a project. So I just said, you know, we'd love to do this, but here's the thing, you know, this has to be told, you know, as a complex story. We have to be willing to talk about the difficult, the long, and the positive. Um, so, you know, it was a, um, it was also a, an excellent learning around partnership. Um, I have a question. If any of you want to share it, it kind of feeds off of what you just said. Do you have any particular incidents? This sounds like a job interview, but <laughs> the incidents you've had where there's been some conflict, bringing up something controversial, either with whether it's the board, whether it's your staff, whether it's a community member, whether it's a big donor. I mean, do you have any stories you'd like to share about that or on, on any level? Because I think that's an important thing for us to hear. Well, everyone has doses. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so the, the way, and, and we've been approaching things like like this all the time. We, uh, the Oakland Museum has been fortunate enough to have a lot of staff training. Um, uh, really great organizations. Um, uh, uh, Sarah Farrow from the International Coalition of Science and Culture did, did a program with us. So, so we knew that our project um, really strong feeling. So we actually went through a lot of training even for the show. So uh, so these these um, group meetings were also uh, involving staff, frontline staff, docents, uh, board, um, and then just regular people um, just to get a sense of what things could come up and be prepared. Uh, um, so so we, we sort of um, it was, it was more pre preparation than the And um, also, I should say that um, the kind of concern about upsetting people, um, I come from, I had this mentor in my former job um, who was quite radical, and he said, if you're not upsetting some people, you're not being clear enough. <laughs> um, so, and, and kind of what Lauren and I were talking about earlier is like museums do have a point of view and not everyone's gonna embrace that point of view. And and so the calculation is who are you serving? You can't serve everyone because it, it sort of undercuts the clarity and the value of what you're doing. So you're gonna upset some people. Uh, and maybe uh, and you know you can good work. Anybody else? No, no, sure. Well, any decisions that we had, we, you know, there was some pushback and, you know, uh, fears or reservations, but um, always kind of recontextualizing it in the sense of values and that we're supporting children and we're creating a safe space for children always seem to kind of bring back that conversation of this is important work, we're, this is necessary work. So, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, so you always know that some people, and we did get very little pushback and and you know comments left on on our social media. My favorite being that we were pushing the gay agenda. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for noticing. Um, you know, so I mean, you, but, you were clear. but we were we were clear what we were doing. We, you know, our, our whole logo turned into a rainbow. It's it's a little a little obvious. Um, but but you know, I think. At, at the end of the day, it, it, we knew we had made the difference to, to more people, and uh, that you know the, the people who are 
who were benefiting from from what we did versus those who were upset by it was was a night and day difference, and it was amazing. And, and to hear the stories from the people, you know, I got to go to Pride myself and, and hear people come up to me and go, oh, I've, I know about the museum, but I didn't know you were you were so friendly to our community, and, and, and I had no idea that you guys valued us so much. And, and for me to hear, and people tell me, you know, we're going to come now that we know that you are so, uh, that you're here means the world to us, and now we're going to come to you as well. And, and, and hearing those stories just, you know, it, it makes it all worth it. Oh, um, <clears throat> one of the struggles our museum has is around time. And um, when we got these fancy vitrines, uh, we drilled holes in them. So we always have this dilemma about whether we screw them in and, <coughs> with, uh, uh, and lock them in every time we display. And so when we were at Grace Cathedral, I was making an argument for not locking them in, except for like a couple things we thought, somebody might want to steal this teddy bear because it's so cute. Um, I might want to steal the governor's pen because it's special. <laughs> So what happened was uh, the thing somebody wanted to steal, when, when somebody tried to steal, was a vitrine full of bad food. So we have an exhibition or installation of the, the terrible food that's fed to children in foster care, like dry milk and terribly canned soups and so forth. And so of the three weeks we were there and the 8,000 people that rolled through, somebody came in and tried to steal the food. So my answer to that situation was to get a bunch of food and if we saw people who looked like they were hungry, we'd give them food. And my staff was like, are you out of your mind? We don't have time for that. This is like, we can't, and then more people will be coming for food. And we have to be really clear about what our goal is here. And so I think, <clears throat> again, that whole museum professional and, and figuring out what you can and can't do was part of that group. Yes, you have a question. Yeah, um, hi. I, um, I wanted to ask, I, I, I feel like I'm an old cynic. So I want to identify myself as such. I've been working in the field for 40 years. And, um, and I'm frustrated. And I feel like we're not doing enough. And um, and I kind of want to know what's what's next. I mean, I feel it's kind of weird because I want to tell you, like, I had a similar experience to what you're talking about I, literally 30 years ago. And I was very grateful then for people being welcoming and behaving well. But it's 30 years ago. Like, what, what's up? And I want to. What's next, and what else we can do to be to push, to push the envelope further? Okay, so the question is from uh, old cynic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old cynic too, actually. But so, what's next? I mean, how how can we change things? You know, well, time has passed. So, what can we do next to make a difference? <laughs> Who's the youngest person? <laughs> <laughs> the future is the youth. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, so I've been in the field for seven years, which is not a long time. And um, you know, what's next, it, it, is, it is sad that we are still pushing for this, and, and, and I completely, completely see that. But um, you know, I'm hopeful again in my primary role as a staff supervisor, I see my staff as the future. They're, they're young college students, they're you know, fresh out of high school. Um, and I see them as, as what's next. You know, my my whole goal is to, to coach them and to help them grow into their own professionals and and knowing that, that we are instilling these values upon them and seeing them take active leadership in that um, is is being again being a children's museum for us specifically, you know, we're, anyway, sorry. Uh, you know, we see the little ones as, as young as, as infants, you know, come in and, and 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 being the ones who are able, again, having developed or helped develop this weekend, um, instilling these values upon them and knowing that this is the message being put out there and this is what's being presented, you know, helps, I think, is, is, is really the next thing is knowing that, that this is what they're raised on, this is what they're going to hang on to, and this is what they're going to continue moving forward. And again, as the young one, youngest one here, you know, I've I've been fortunate to have had that experience and I and I only see it continuing and, and growing from from there. So an older person can say something. <laughs> 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 no? Well well I'll say something while you guys are thinking that so, so one of the projects I work on is civil liberties. And years before if somebody said I'd be doing this, I'd be going 
That's lame, because civil liberties, if you've ever taken civics in high school, it's one of the most, maybe it's different now, but back then it was one of the most boring things I could imagine. Besides, talking about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, it's so basic that it doesn't sound very radical. But I think we're entering into a time period that's really, really, really different. Some of the most basic institutions are being challenged. Like, does the judiciary actually have the right to question what the president does? I mean, if you remember back in high school, yeah, of course. But now people are saying, yeah, don't forget that. So I've, just, I've been discovering that people actually are more open to talking about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, in a way very different than before. And it's actually a way that tends to unite people across broad ranges. Because you don't have to be a leftist degree. You know, you could be a Republican. It's actually not partisan. And it seems like an odd thing. but. I feel that there's a basis to bring people together. And um, you know, that fits with museums, since they're a public space that's supposed to be open and welcoming to everybody. Not just everything's always nice, nice, but a, a place to be able to learn and talk. So that's what gives me hope. I mean, I still, I'm, in, I'm an old cynic too, but you know, I struggle with that. And hearing these people, it makes me feel a lot better about things. Like, yeah, this is a great field to be in. So, I have to agree, civics is super sexy these days. <laughs> it just turns me off. No, because um, when I was in New York, my wife created me Hamilton. Hey. So, yeah, Why? Yeah, it's great. So, it's like a total surprise. But it's basically about um, this country. Like, this country is crazy radical. Um, and, and so the, the Constitution is like this this invention by these wild people. Um, and so, so I think, so, so you young people, it can get worse. It's not a sin, so it, it, it should motivate you not to be lazy about this world. It could get, we think it's bad now that we have um, some orange glow monster in the White House. It could get even worse. Um, so I think I think that's the hope. Is like this moment. If, if you're concerned about whether this moment is going to change, I think there was a bit of fear in a lot of people, um, and I think we should not forget. And also, you know, transform the idea that museums are not passive research centers or more active agents in how the world is constructed. And uh, I just. Uh, I'm only going to speak to young people because otherwise I have no reason to give advice. But um, but don't think of museums as passive places. We have incredible power, and that's your that's what you're being paid to do to build the world. So you have to ask yourself, what sort of world do you want to build? What sort of world does the institution want to build? Um, because a world's going to come out of it one way or the other, and, and for museums, to so, sort of stuck in the past and, and not feeling like they, they have a responsibility to the public, it's, it's, it's going to go to bad places and it can get worse. Can I add something? Yeah. So I, was, I went to my first professional museum conference last year and everyone was just so rip-roaring excited because the um, American Museum Association had its very first female director in the live event and I was like, are you fucking serious? Like, everyone's like clapping like crazy, like, oh my god. And I was like brand new, right, from, from a radathon. I'm like, why is this so heavy? How the fuck did this happen? What is going on here? And um, so what I, what I thought you did really well, Renee, was you put numbers in and you said social justice um, brings people to museums. Social justice is something people will pay for. It's a story that makes a difference. And so I think those of us doing museum work needed it super capitalistic way. No, it's super, <laughs> smart, super smart and strategic about the stories that we tell. I know I need to take a class from you. And, um, and learn how to talk about how it does make a difference, um, how, how our museums become more successful by telling the more true stories that haven't been out there and by getting into the community. And we support the museum that do that. And then the other thing is when you're dissatisfied with the museum, say so. So the Museum of Man in San Diego, I didn't want to step foot in it because it's called the Museum of Man. I met these group, they're the grooviest people that work there. And when I went up to them, my first thing I said, okay, what the hell is up with your name? And they're like, we totally agree and we're talking about changing. So I think talking about what you're dissatisfied with is part of how we make the shows. I, I, I got two, I got two for you, Randy. Ready. All right, so the first is that 
we will, and I don't know what year this is going to happen, but we will rediscover that we actually need our physical spaces. So I can't tell you from the moment that I started sharing this idea for the Adoption Museum Project with people, I get the question, why? Why would you want to build a building? So I don't think I mentioned at some point, right, long-term vision, we really believe there is a role for a physical building to play. Um, in the meantime, we do projects mm -hmm. in other spaces, but we're really committed to this idea of right, a physical space. And there is there are certain experiences and exchanges and kinds of learning and reflection that can only happen in physical space and human to human. Right. So I think that it, you know it's not going to just keep going virtually. If we are going to come back around, we're going to say, oh my god, you know, we have to rediscover the importance and the value of our physical spaces. So that's the first. The second is that um, I think not every museum needs to be a social justice explicitly social justice museum. Um, not every museum, right, has to claim that and do that work. Um, but I think those who are can completely <coughs> push it around museum as intervention, as a very concrete way of helping to solve a social problem. And sometimes I think, you know, what would be our greatest um, accomplishment would be not to win a museum award. It would be to win an award for transformation, right, in adoption. It would be to win an award um, in a completely different field, right? But that work came through the museum. So it's almost like, you know, on the one hand, we're going to rediscover the value of museum spaces, and on the other hand, it's almost like we have to transcend it, you know? And it's it's just the, the vehicle through, right? But it has these very special qualities. One more question. One more question. How about you right there? Um, so I was wondering about you, how you engage or tactics or strategies that you have to get people who maybe aren't like initially super enthusiastic about this exhibit about justice, and how do you get those people to the door? It seems like a lot of times um, you may be preaching to the fire, so to speak. So what's the strategy to get more people to see, to see so, so the question is, how do you get people to be interested in the social justice issue, perhaps, that you're, you're promoting when they may not seem enthusiastic? How do you get them into the door? Um, you know, I, I think a lot of this language can be shrill. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I, obviously I have a, you know, my hair is on fire at this moment, I guess, like when one of the friends about the last time around, it's really right. But, but, but I think not having, not demonstrating a space for different points of view, or demonstrating that the space for others, you have to welcome. Um, you know, no one wants to come to something where they're going to um, yell at. Um, and I would. Um, and then also, you know, acknowledge that once they're there, that's one, you know, that that's, um, I have a particular relationship to audience because I grew up in the East Bay. You know, I lived most of my life in the city, I did most of it. But for me, when I think of an audience, I think of my mom, who's like 80 something, and my nieces and nephews who are using the museum. And when they come to the museum, I'm like, wow, that, uh, they're spending a little bit of their precious time and so I think you have to respect that and honor that, regardless of how, you know, what what people think of your subject. And I think that can go a lot, a long way over time when people trust. You know, it's basically building trust in folks. Now, you know, um, museums or cultural institutions offer a lot of different things. You can't offer the same thing all the time. But over time, you have to build that trust that, regardless of what they don't understand the work that they're about to experience, they'll trust that uh, they're welcome, you're not going to be shrill, you're going to be um, acknowledged for this um, trust that you put in us. And, and I think it's really a long-term relationship. Um, and, you know, marketing can be all the stuff, and but it's really a long-term thing that it's the project. Yeah, any other last comments to that question? Well, I, I would add, it, it, it's going to sound terrible, but trickery. 
Um, so, for example, <laughs> we had our tattoo exhibit up in a, a brewery, um, and so people came for beer, and they got they got to the museum. And uh, we also had it up in Grace Cathedral, which had has thousands of people come every day, and they were coming to see the cathedral, and then they got to see ours. So trickery might be a little rude way to say it, but. Um, you know, a strategy. How about that? A strategy. And in the Children's Discovery Museum, we already have a captive audience, right? Who are already coming through the doors to play. So, and then it's just offering different levels of engagement, you know, with the material. Yeah, a lot of self but, you know, and like Heidi said, people came to our, our, our Pride Celebration Weekend not even knowing that it was our Pride Celebration Weekend. They, they came to play this museum and that's what they got. And, and, um, and yeah, and, and I do think it's a matter of framework as well. You know, we, we wanted to address, you know, pride in, in the LGBTQ community, but we also wanted to address family. And, and the name of the weekend is Proud of My Family, and it really does boil down to whatever family means to you, and it, it had that duality to it. And, and it could it could be twisted, not twisted, but it could be, it could mean something to, to anyone. Well, I think uh, we're going to have to close our question and answer on our panel here.